Uh, Raid. Raid Shadow Legends, yes. Ah! Oh. Yo, yo, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Yes, more on them in just a bit. But now, today's video. Ah! Oh. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, he's dying! Call 911! What's the number? Here we go, it's gonna be a good one. I've got a slight cold. Can you tell? My voice is a little bit nasally because of the cold. You're joking. Not another one? This is an episode of Brain Blaze. I am Blaze Boy. What happens here is Danny writes me a script. I'm gonna read the script and make it just a little bit more shit. Sam is gonna sprinkle in some of the finest vintage memes you've ever seen. And I'm gonna try and get through this without feeling all tired because as I mentioned three times already, what are we a minute in? I have a cold. That's not my problem. It's yours. Five brands that don't exist anymore and how it all went wrong. The most amazing thing is I feel like we should actually be doing the script five brands that still exist and it's kind of amazing that they do. Like I feel like Union Carbide or like whatever owned Union Carbide. Still a thing. It's like yo, Union Carbide, holy shit. Also IBM, how the f did you survive the Second World War you f***ing Nazi? I mean allegedly helping the Nazis. Uh, I mean, they definitely helped the Nazis. I just called them Nazis, which I didn't mean. That was a mistake. Allegedly. Allegedly a mistake. Or did I allegedly mean alleged? Look, it's all very confusing. I'm not calling IBM Nazis, but let's just say that I f IBM. I won't buy their sh How are they still around? Every once in a blue moon, I make the long and ridiculously expensive train journey to my hometown of Rotherham to catch up with family and friends, take a trip down memory lane and remind myself, oh, for fuck's sake, tripping all over my bionic ass today. What? I gotta like hang this up or something. It's fing driving me insane. Is that gonna work? I mean, there's gonna be this big wire all over the place, but I just keep tripping over it. Fuck. Call it Whistler. So you'll get a knuckle supper. I'm also more irritable because I've got a cold. <laughs> so it's like all those little things. You're like, ah, for fing sake. I'm standing on it again right now! Fuck. Oh my god. Daddy, chill. It always feels a little bit sad when I wander around the town centre and realise that I barely recognise it. The typical shopping trip from years ago might have involved a visit to Microfun, Cooper's Toys, Rumbelows, and Crazy Collins cracking cut price culinary cucumber and coconut custard concoctions. Ah, Danny, first time I got that. Ah, challenge me! But today, they've all been lost to changing trends, new technologies, bad decisions, arson attacks, holy sh the North, ah! And a long string of health inspection violations. Holy sh the North. Ah, yeah, I did that twice because two things. It's the North. It's, it's weird up there. The fuck is he talking about? If I had ever been in a hurry back in the day, I probably could have bought everything I ever needed at Woolworths. But even that great British institution has fallen to the sands of time. Woolworths is such a piece of sh Like, I never understood that story. It just sells a bunch of junk that nobody would ever want. And it's like, why would I go here? Like, what do I need? Like, some sweets and a lawnmower? This isn't a Tesco. Like, what's going on? How? It just doesn't make sense. One of my biggest memories from my childhood is like, I remember like, you know, you go into Woolworths and there's the sweet counter and stuff and you like, uh, it's called a pick and mix in the UK. I don't know what you call it in America, but you essentially grab your own sweets and you put them in a bag. And I was in there with a friend of mine and his mum, like we were kids, I don't know, like 11, 12, and his mum's just trying them. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, I did ask that, but she's like, yeah, you could try them before you, you know, before you buy them. And I'm like, I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> but that really stuck with me. There was always something quintessentially British about Woolworths, or Woolies, as it's more affectionately known. A staple of the UK high street for over a century, it was the cheap and cheerful one-stop shop for toys, clothing, kitchen supplies, gardening equipment, entertainment media, carbon monoxide detectors, and the legendary pick-and-mix sweets, there we go, which attracted young thieves and my friend's mum from every corner of town. You could pretty much do all of your Christmas shopping there in one fell swoop and still have enough money left over for a slap-up pub meal down at The Bucket of Pig. Did you really go to a place called The Bucket of Pig? I mean, it's, I mean, it sounds like KFC if it was KFP. What? I thought it's a good idea to serve food in buckets. <laughs> what the fuck? Why is that so good? And the unusual thing about the Great British Institution is that it was wholly American. Oh, sh**. When Frank Winfield Woolworth opened the first store in Utica? Utica? 
New York in 1879, the general public hadn't really seen anything like it before. Admittedly, it was a complete failure, and it closed within three months. Uh, at least they got it over with quickly. We were stuck on for a century. But when he made a second attempt with a store in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, the general the general public had never seen the first store, hadn't really seen anything like it before. For starters, every single product in the store was just pri was priced at just five or ten cents, a business model which would later inspire a five and dime shopping revolution across the United States. I assume a dime is ten cents. The more you know. It was kind of like the Poundland or dollar store of its day. You knew everything inside. The store was largely tat, but it was reassuringly cheap tat. Yeah, how was the Poundland? How has that survived? Poundland was a thing when I was a kid. I assume it's a thing today. And but inflation. Inf either everything in Poundland has got somehow more shit, which seems like a physical impossibility. Or is it now like one pound fifty store? Like two pound store? It really must be. Dude, I don't know if I can pound your grandma. You're joking. The store was also the first to trust customers enough to actually let them wander around the store unsupervised and browse the merchandise on display at their leisure. Prior to this, customers usually walked into a store with a shopping list, which they handed to the shopkeeper, who would then put everything together from a position of safety behind the counter. And I know that sounds incredibly backwards, like why would you do this? But I'm just like, that sounds great. I could just give someone a list, they'll pick up all of the sh put it in a basket for me and I can leave? That sounds like exactly what I want from a shopping experience and it's now what I do. Like you go online and you're like, what do you want? And then it's delivered to your door by a man. Brilliant. The very idea of just letting customers roam free must have seemed like putting the animals in charge of the feeding time at the zoo. But the brave new concept gave customers the freedom to inspect the goods, compare items, and consider making fairly spontaneous purchases for the first time. Yeah, and I understand why it's good business, because people will just be like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll have that giant box of fudge. Why not? Why not, eh? I'll just pick that up on my way out of the store. Oh yeah, I need some chewing gum. Oh yeah, I need some cigarettes. Whatever you buy, you know, all that sort of random shit that you don't need. And which is another reason why I just like to be able to hand someone a list and be like, go get the things I need. So I don't get distracted by all the other that I don't. By 1909, Woolworth had expanded into hundreds of stores across North America and had even taken its first step overseas with the launch of the first UK shop in Liverpool. Considering that most people seemed unaware at the time that there were other bits of England that existed outside of... Wait, there are other bits of England that exist outside of London? Really? Uh, it may seem unusual to set up shop near the Liverpool docks. Liverpool. The Daily Mail reported its own suspicions about these American visitors coming over here with their weird shopping habits. The paper reckoned that the company had chosen Liverpool so that when, every, when everything inevitably went tits up, it would be easier for them to just escape the mounting debts and scarper back home across the ponds. So yeah, those lazy Liverpool debt collectors, they'll never get us! Not for the first or last time the Daily Mail was talking out of its ass. The explanation, the expansion proved to be a massive success as UK customers embraced this new five and dime experience or three pence and sixpence as it became known this side of the Atlantic. Throughout the course of the 20th century, the Woolworths brand grew into a massive empire with over 8,000 stores across North America and a further 800 in the UK. Just to confuse matters, another other Woolworths had sprung up in Australia in 1924, but this had no relation to the original company. They also have it in South Africa, but it's like a, it's just a supermarket. It's just a big regular supermarket. I'm not sure if it's owned by this Woolworths or whatever. I mean, probably not because they're now gone, but whatever. This isn't important or interesting. Carry on. When the charmingly named Percy Christmas and his entrepreneurial buddies launched their own version of a stupendous bargain basement store down under, they decided to cash in on the famous F.W. Woolworth brand. They even registered the identical name on Australian soil, and nobody in the U.S. considered raising an objection at the time. Probably because it took like six months for a message by boat to get there. <laughs> in the past, like, you can get away with so much shit because everything just moves slow slowly. Now I'd just be like, yeah, I'm suing you. You're f screwed. I'm taking your business and your country. What? Towards the latter half of the 20th century, the original Woolworths had grown beyond its five and dime roots. Not surprising, really, as five cents wouldn't have bought very much in the 1960s. This is my argument about Poundland. What the f do you buy for a pound these days? Nothing. Maybe a can of Coke if you're lucky. And diversified into a bigger discount department store format. But the US side of the outfit was already beginning to struggle in the face of increased competition from the likes of Walmart and Kmart. Is Kmart still around? I feel like everyone's heard of Walmart. I've heard of Walmart, but Kmart? It sounds like if someone said Kmart, I'd be like, 
It sounds like a fake version of Walmart that they used in a movie because they didn't want to pay Walmart to use their brand or something. Or the movie was about serial killers in Walmart and Walmart didn't want to be associated with it. No, what the fuck are you talking about? In desperate need of cash injection, the US parent company sold off the UK arm in 1982, leading to the formation of the Woolworths Group as an independent British entity. But this wasn't enough to save the parent company, which stumbled on until 1997 before finally closing its doors after 118 years of service. The US roots of the company live on in Foot Locker. What? Really? The legal continuation of the same company, which Woolworths had originally launched on the side in 1963. The more you know. The UK arm lived on for a couple of decades longer before it too buckled under the strain of emerging competition from the likes of Poundland. <laughs> yeah, boy. Ah, Poundland. You're getting name checked a lot in today's episode. By the 21st century, this great British institution from America was looking a bit like an outdated relic, which had lost its way and was failing to attract a new generation of shoppers. Analysts at the time reflected on how Woolworth still sold itself as the shop that tries to be all things to all people, but in reality, it wasn't serving anybody very effectively. It's like all of these things, you know, they're just on the British institution. It's like you think of like big British brands, and it's always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're owned by like some Chinese hedge funds or by like isn't the, all of the British cars that you think about like Aston Martin, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, all of these they're definitely owned they're like is it Aston Martin I'm pretty sure is owned by BMW, Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce also owned by BMW? No that can't be right maybe Aston Martin's owned by Volvo? Who the f*** knows but they're never owned by British companies they're not British companies anymore which is weird I guess Britain's just a bit shit. <laughs> oh dear Cringe. The financial crisis of 2008 was the final nail in the coffin for the discount deal lawnmower as the company's debts racked up to nearly £400 million. The group would keen to take up an offer to sell the company to Hilco UK for the princely sum of just £1. It's possible that some of the stores have survived. <laughs> Imagine going into Woolworth, into, into Poundland, and there's just a little one off deal. The Woolworths Company. Don't buy it because you'll be 399 million nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine pounds in debt. It will be an error on your part. <laughs> It's possible that some of the stores could have survived if Hilco had been allowed to take on the debts and restructure the operation, and it might have seemed quite fitting in a way that the last major surviving outpost of the original Five and Dime store would itself be bought for just one pound. Sadly, the group's banks didn't fancy it and called the debts, leaving Woolworths to enter administration and close down all 807 stores early in 2009, almost exactly a century after the first store opened up in Liverpool. Well, it sounds like he should have just not expanded from Liverpool, be like, yeah, 400 million pounds in debt. Bye, Liverpool! <laughs> Suckers! However, the Australian copycats are still going strong today with the stolen name of and evolved into Australia's biggest supermarket chain. Probably a lesson to be learned in there somewhere. I bet their pick and mix isn't half as good, though. Was Woolworths pick and mix good? Pick and mix is so weird. Because, like, especially now, like, with the COVID times, you're like, wait, I just have to touch that shovel and move all this, like, weird food that's just loose around in this plastic lucite box into, like, a bag? That sounds disgusting. Especially after like my friend's mum's been jamming her hands in there and just like eating sh like on the top top cola butters. My germ. I don't know why I'm doing that. She was quite a nice lady, if I remember correctly. I was, I was like 11. I don't really remember much about her other than the fact that she ate the pick mix in Woolworths. Oldsmobile. Not being a knowledgeable American driver myself, come to think of it, not being any of those things on any level. Oh yeah, Danny doesn't drive. I forget about that. It kind of makes me sad. And <laughs> I'm just joking. Because last every time I'm like, ah, Danny can't drive, people are like, don't make fun of that, Simon. That's uh, discriminatory. Uh, like, discrimination against people who can't drive. <laughs> ah! You f***ing idiot. That's not going to age well when, like, dis discriminating against people who can't drive becomes, like, the latest woke thing and I get fully cancelled. I mean, worth it. Worth it. Worth it. Yeah. Okay, it's worth it. I wasn't massively familiar with the Oldsmobile car brand. I've heard of it. I can't, like, imagine what they look like. I imagine they look old and shit because they're American. Uh, I assumed at first that it might be a range of coffin-shaped coffin mobility scooters aimed at a more mature customer. But no, the name for this respected and beloved automaker was derived from the original founder, Ransomy Olds, who set up the Olds Motor Vehicle Company in, 1980, in 1897 and launched the first Oldsmobile car, the curved Dash Oldsmobile in 1901. This is an OG vehicle. The funny thing is that having lumbered the brand with a deeply unfortunate name, Mr. Olds quickly buggered off as 
early as 1904 after falling out with his major investor and sales manager. But his name was kept on the cars for over a hundred years as his company was snapped up by General Motors in 1908, who went on to sell around 35 million Oldsmobiles to middle-income Americans. I suppose the name... I suppose the name of the brand could have been worse. Imagine if Ronald McDonald had been called Hepatitis A Salmonella. <laughs> ah! What does the A stand for? AIDS? Possibly. What? Regardless of the creaky name, Oldsmobile was seen as an, innov innovation, an innovative brand for the best part of the 20th century. It was the first brand of car to introduce fully automatic transmissions. Oh my god. Like, being British, like, when I was growing up and learning to drive, you every car was manual. Like, it was unusual to have an automatic car, and I know in America it's the exact opposite. When I was growing up, air conditioning was not a common thing in cars, and it makes me sound f***ing old. Like, I'm like, yeah, no, cars didn't used to have air conditioning. I'm 34, what the f*** UK? Oh dear. Cringe. You'd go over to America and it's like every piece of shit has air conditioning and is automatic. And in the UK we're all like f***ing sweating driving our piece of sh cars with like a clutch. And so what the f***? I'm never driving a manual car again. It's just shit. I mean, unless it's like a sports car, then you're like, okay, cool, because it's fun. But just driving like a regular ass car in traffic with a manual is like, what am I up to? Car basic, my car basically drives itself nowadays, which is fantastic. Cause I don't like doing boring, I like driving, I like cars. I just don't like all the boring associated with it. You have a poison in your mind and the fact that you can't see it makes me so sad. It was the first uh, automatic transitions. It was also the first brand to offer glass windshields. Oh my God, what were they making them from before? <laughs> Just like steel? Is that, this isn't much good, is it? I can't see shit. Speedometers and airbags as standard equipment. Oldsmobile enjoyed a strong reputation for superb engineering combined with magnificent power and the Oldsmobile Cutlass would go on to become the best-selling car in America for several years during the 1970s and 80s. But <laughs> This is the worst named car ever, what do you call it? Well, we called it like Oldsmobile, which as we've discussed is already shit. Isn't a cutlass like a pirate sword? It's embarrassing if I got that wrong, but I think it's a pirate sword. So it's named car pirate sword. What the f But it appeared as if the brand had already finally begun to run out of power during the very late 1980s as Oldsmobile was struggling to engage new, younger customers. We'd reached a point where Oldsmobile was finally living up to its name. So, in an attempt to make the brand hip again... I don't understand these watches. I have like a Fitbit and it just told me I did 250 out of 250 steps. Nicely done. Great job. So what the f are you talking about? According to this thing, I've done 10,563 steps today. Why are you suddenly counting 250 and then buzzing me about it? I don't understand. Also, it dramatically overreads my steps because look, 563, right? Just going about my day, doing some normal shit, taking absolutely zero f steps. Oh, 563. Well, look, that is a terrible example because normally there's no f way I've done 10,563 steps today. It's just utterly impossible. I got up, I took a tram to work, and then I walked to get my lunch. I've maybe walked 200 meters today. <laughs> be nice if it'd be a little bit, little, little bit, less, little bit less sh**. The only reason I have it is because I needed a silent alarm to wake me up in the morning, to not wake my wife and kids when I get out of bed at five o'clock because I work like a machine. <laughs> so in an attempt of where the f or what, what's going on, Oldsmobile s like that. So in an attempt to make the brand hip again, Oldsmobile came up with a frankly terrible marketing campaign which tried to convince younger drivers that Oldsmobile wasn't just for your dad. In fact, that's pretty much the line they went to, to print ads with. The slogan read, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. For the accompanying TV commercials, they roped in William Shatner and Wing Ringo Starr, holy s***, who appeared, that is gonna cost you, appeared in two separate ads and were uh, which were led by their respective young adult daughters. Melanie Shadner and Leah Starr showed off the new Cutlass Supreme vehicles while their raging fathers observed. I like how they're aging and it's like they're both still alive. And this was like in the 70s or something. While their aging fathers observed how the cars were very different from the 
trucks that I used to drive in the olden days. Ready, Dad? I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Steady as she goes. Yes, I know that William Shatner is now taking trips into space at the age of 90 and looks in better shape than some people half his age, but even back then, he was getting on a bit. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, Will Shatner, William Shatner, does not look 90 years old. <laughs> it's like, whoa. And he's also, like, still smart. You hear him talk about it and you're like, how come you're not crazy? All the 90-year-olds are at least a little bit crazy. What's up? <laughs> how do you do that? The marketing campaign spectacularly backfired from the exhaust pipe with an almighty plume of smoke. For starters, it only served to alienate the loyal older customer base who were now being told that the new range of Oldsmobiles wasn't for them. Yeah, and they were also saying all of the stuff we made previously was a bit sh**. And despite the presence of former Enterprise captain, it didn't do an awful lot to inspire the next generation of customers either. ba da ba 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 da da The TV commercials had hired a couple of celebrities that your dad would recognize to try and convey a message that the car brand was for younger drivers, while the print ads only reinforced the impression that Oldsmobile had a deeply uncool reputation for being a pensioner's car. We can't just blame the ads for the declining sales and the eventual retirement of Oldsmobile, though. By the 1990s, the brand known for innovation had just become very ordinary and wasn't remotely distinctive from any of the other cars that General Motors appeared to be investing far more attention into. Future's now, old man. It was as if General Motors themselves had grown tired of the brand. And the New York Times declared that Oldsmobile had now become an unattractive choice for people who don't like cars very much. Wait, it was an unattractive... Th isn't that a double negative? So it's an attractive choice for people who like cars. I mean, I guess it's not necessarily a double negative like that, but it's... It's confusingly worded, New York Times. Almost exactly a century after Ransom E. Olds departed his... his was his first name Ransom? How did I not comment on that? Who's the fuck called first name Ransom? Uh, departed his own company, the very last Oldsmobile rolled off the production line in 2004. The brands may have been in poor health when William Shatner was beamed down to rescue the waning fortunes of the Oldsmobile. But it's worse than that. He's dead, Jim. <laughs> nice. Nice. Ah, but before we talk about all of that jolly good stuff, a word from our friends over at Squarespace. Yes! This is a time in the world where people are creating more than ever before. It says age of creation here, and that kind of makes sense. You know, everyone's making a YouTube channel, a podcast, a website. It does feel like everyone is up to something. I know it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My, uh, my every, I don't even know how you, I was going to go let, yeah, my cousin's friends got a podcast, but it's like, no, 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 literally be everybody you know, where it's like, oh, I'm going to do a podcast about that. <laughs> going to do something about this, going to start a YouTube channel. And if you want to do any of that stuff, well, make sure you've got a website to go along with it. Or maybe you just want a website to uh, start a blog or uh, an online store. Squarespace also do that. It's all brilliant, really, and it's all very easy to use. And that's the best thing about Squarespace. Look, if you want something like super customized and everything, you don't need to make it hard for yourself. Just go to Squarespace and you'll be like, yeah, yeah, okay, well, I want that there and this there, and I'm very fussy and particular and all of that stuff. And Squarespace is like, cool, that's totally fine. We're just gonna make it easy for you to implement that fussiness about all of the little bits and pieces. Or, if you're not like that at all, like your boy here, you're kind of like, I mean, I don't want to say lazy, but just like, like just don't care that much. Uh, you could just go select one of their beautiful templates and you click on it and then you're like, yeah, okay, I'll change the title, change the name of that page, swap that picture out. Jobs are good and and that's what's great about Squarespace because then you've got like this beautiful looking website and you, I mean you really it probably doesn't say this here but you really didn't even have to try <laughs> it's just like yeah boom done and all of that technical stuff like I've used other website builders hosts or whatever you want to call it before and it's like well there's all sorts of updates and weird stuff going on and then it crashes and you don't know what's going it's like oh no that's just broken now. And then you got to find someone on like Fiverr who knows how to fix stuff. And it's like, oh no, what am, I, what am I doing? Not with Squarespace. With Squarespace, everything just works beautifully. Say here, no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. You're goddamn right. Uh, there's also a bunch of other features that they have, which is nice. There's the email campaigns. Yeah. Patronage portals. Yes. Social integrations. Of course. Member any areas, analytics, commercial options. 24-7 customer support just in case you get stuck. But honestly, it's fairly basic. You probably won't. I remember when we first started working with Squarespace. I was I'm just going to reach out to their support to see if it's any good. <laughs> and I was just like, does anyone reply to this? Hello. <laughs> and uh, yeah, someone totally did, which, which, which was nice. Um, it was nice that it was the truth. <laughs> yeah! So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. You can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you are ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash blaze and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. 
And now, back to today's video. Friends Reunited. Oh, I've heard of this. Wasn't this like Facebook before Facebook? I mean, or like before MySpace or whatever. Oh my god, Facebook's such a piece of I swear, like every day, like, I read the news and there's something else about Facebook being an absolute piece of its company. And then the other day, someone sends me a message and it's like, hey Simon, have you seen this video about Facebook? And it's like a five year old uh, Kurtz, Kurtzegart? I'm not sure if that's the pronunciation of that channel. It's awesome. But they're like, it's a five year old video about how Facebook is basically where people are stealing videos off YouTube and uploading them onto Facebook. And of course, this happens to me. It's like, oh, brilliant. So people are stealing my work, uploading it to Facebook and getting the advertising revenue. And it's like, Facebook does absolutely dick all about this. And it's like, this was from five years ago. And I'm like, oh, so Facebook was always a piece of shit, huh? Allegedly, in my opinion. No, it just is. It just is, in my opinion. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. Ah, before the days of Facebook, Wikipedia, and even YouTube, the early days of the internet was a very different place. Whoa, this was before, like, Wikipedia? I thought Wikipedia was, like, internet OG. Sh this was the era of Napster and Ask Jeeves, and if you lived in the UK, it was the era of Friends Reunited. I remember how extraordinary it felt when I first realized that almost everyone in my old school class could now be found by the click of a button. You didn't really get to divulge much information in your limited profile. You were only given a couple of sentences to play with uh, where, when you were painting a picture of your post-school life. Oh my god, who cares? Like, I don't know, I also realized I just didn't like Facebook, so I got rid of Facebook. And then I just realized I don't really know what anyone in my life is up to. Like, I mean, of course, I know what my friends are up to because, and this is the thing with Facebook. It's like, look, I kept in touch with the people I wanted to keep in touch with because they are my friends. I don't really have interest in what anyone else is up to. It's just like, I don't care. I'm just not, I don't know. Does that make me like just an uninterested dick? But it's like, I don't know. It's just, it was just boring. I mean, not that people's lives are boring. It's just like, it's got nothing to do with me. You have a poison in your mind. And if it's like, I w if I want to follow like random people's lives and what they're up to, which I don't, it's like, well, wouldn't I follow like people who are like, up to some, like I don't know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or whatever. He's always up to some crazy shit, I assume. I don't follow anyone. Like, <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. But it's like, who cares? Facebook. Some members used every available digit to gloat over their wealth and success. Others largely failed in their attempts to disguise the fact that they were unemployed and alone and staring into the void, while others simply took the opportunity to declare that they'd always despised everyone in the class in the first place. Yeah, however, one thing that, that does feel quite good. There's a few people who I, who I knew at school and uh, just randomly like I got a contact form and emailed. They're like, hey, dude. I was just on YouTube and I was like, I know that dude. What the, who, what, this guy? And I was like, yeah, cool. That feels, that feels, that feels quite good. <laughs> Cause I'm a vain narcissistic mother But I also don't care. Uh, some, <laughs> the idea apparently came from husband and wife team, Julie and Steve Pankhurst from North London. While on maternity leave, Julie found herself wondering what her old schoolmates were up to these days and reasons that there must be a way to harness the power of the internet to rekindle old friendships and acquaintances. That's the official backstory anyway. It could just be that Julie had seen how well classmates had done as a website in the US since its launch in 1995 and figured that a similar idea could be launched in the UK. Uh, I, I kind of respect the latter one more because it's like, yeah, 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 you, you, you smart business decision, a really good business decision rather than just like, it came to me in a dream. <laughs> it came to me in a dream. <laughs> It came to me in a dream. 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 Julie and Steve hooked up with business partner Jason Porter to set up Friends Reunited in 2000. After an initial experiment with advertising failed, the site soon grew in momentum when a paywall was introduced. The idea... That's a bit of a weird one. It's like, yeah, yeah, no one wanted it when we advertised it, but we asked people to pay for it and suddenly it did well. Okay. The idea was that everyone was free to browse the profiles of other members, and to be fair, this was what most of the nosy visitors were interested in doing, but you had to pay an annual fee of £7.50 if you wanted to do something as reckless as actually sending a message to one of your old friends. Uh, £7.50 a year. What's that, like 10 bucks? It feels extraordinarily reasonable compared to how much the internet costs today. It's like every month I'm like, Netflix, what the f 
Why is it 20 bucks? When did that happen? What? What? Because <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, you want, you, want it, you want 4K? It's like, yeah. And then the next thing you know, it's expensive. I mean, it's not expensive as like Sky or like that, but like Jesus. Although the percentage of annual subscribers was relatively small, it was enough to help turn the website into a UK phenomenon and it led to an expansion in Australia and New Zealand. By 2005, Friends Reunited boasted 15 million members, over a million of whom were happily paying the annual fee. Well, good for you. Here's a phone. Call somebody who cares. Perhaps not everyone was using it exactly the right way. Some disgruntled members were just determined to exact their revenge on their former school teachers. In 2002, Jonathan Spencer from Doncaster used his profile description to slag off Mr. Murray, alleging that the teacher had been sacked in 1983 after making rude remarks about girls and strangling a pupil. Holy <laughs> dude. If that's not true, you're getting sued. <laughs> In fact, Mr. Murray had retired without a blob on his copybook, and he sued the former pope, uh, pupil for character assassination. He was awarded £1,250 in God's compensation. <laughs> I'm always so worried about talking shit, and then it's like, yeah, it cost you a grand. And I mean, I don't want to be like, oh, 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 nothing to me, but it is like, it, it, it is like definitely at the lower end of what I would be concerned about. It's like I found out the other day that the fine for like parking in the wrong zone was like 20 quid in Prague and I've, al I've always been I didn't know what the fine was and then one time I forget to buy myself a parking ticket and I get a fine for like 20 pounds and I was always like oh my god gotta buy a parking ticket gotta get get in the app and do all of this and since I found out that it was like 20 quid and I've parked illegally a few times and forgotten to buy tickets and I've just not got fined looks like you're up to no good again so I'm kind of just like way less stressed about it. It's like, yeah, of course I'll buy a ticket if I remember. But if I don't, I'm not going to be like, oh my God, I'm going to get a fine. And also one of the biggest problems with fines is there always used to be a hassle to pay. I remember like I used to always forget to do pay and display like because just I'm dumb, like dumb, dumb. And it would always be like, you've got a fine. You have to pay it within seven days or it's going to double. You need to like send a check to some address. And I'm like, motherfucker, where's my checkbook? It's like 2000 and... When was I allowed to drive? Like 2005. <laughs> What's going on? Even back then, no one uses checks. And now it's like the fine arrives, it's a QR code, you scan it with your phone, and it's done. And you're like, okay. Cool story, Hansel. He was awarded uh, as, okay, blah, blah, blah. But he didn't seem very happy with the sum. He later complained, I have dedicated 32 years to education, and if my reputation is worth only £1,250, then that's pathetic. That's not how it works, Mr. Murray. You're being awarded, like, money to compensate you for a loss, not like because you were a teacher for so long. I mean, your lawyer should have explained this. He probably did, to be honest, when you got the £1,250. He was like, yeah, yeah, that's that's about right. And Mr. Murray just didn't listen from that point on, even though he probably spent his entire career telling people to listen. <laughs> In 2005, a bigger payday came round for the foundation, founders of the website when Friends Reunited was sold to broadcaster ITV for £120 million. Yes! From which the Pankhursts and Jason Porter each pocketed £30 million. Oh, I guess they had other investors later on, but still, that is a, that is a lot of money, my guys. Michael Grade, the ITV chairman at the time, described the website as the sweet spot of the internet and one of the most important and profitable bits of ITV going forward. Mate, you were wrong. Wrong! I'm not sure which Joker gave Michael Grade the job as chairman by 2008. Friends reunited how late? Two, three years. Ah. Friends reunited lost nearly 50% of its unique users and was sold to comic producer DC Thompson the following year for just 25 million pounds. Wait, is that like DC Comics or is that a different thing? And just two years later, DC Thompson revised the value of their new asset to just over five million pounds. Oh. But I love it when the people who come up with the idea sell it at just that sweet moment. And then some rich companies like just screws it up, gets like f***ed over. I don't know why, but it's like, I don't like, I think it's because I actively like schadenfreude against other people. It's like, you don't want that. It's just unpleasant. It's not a nice thing to feel. You should just want success for other people. When it's a faceless corporation, you're like, ah, ha, ha, f*** you, you sucker. Take my 120 million. Yes. Word. But when news broke in 2016, the Friends Reunited was closing down forever. Holy shit, this was around five years ago. Ah, most of us were just amazed that the site had still been running all this time. 
and we'd last taken a look at it a decade earlier. The problem was that neither ITV nor DC Thompson really seemed to know what to do with it in the face of fresh competition from MySpace and Facebook. Not only were these new social media sites far more engaging and interactive, they were also entirely free. Although friends reunited, ah yes, <laughs> except you are the customer. If, if something's free, you're the customer. Your date is the customer. Advertising to you makes you the customer. Like this, this is entirely free, but obviously I'm getting paid because of advertising. <laughs> Excellent. And I f love that. Honestly, this is one of the best things about this job, about this, what I do. It's like I get to make all of it for free. You, I mean, you get to watch it all for free and enjoy all of what I hope is like half semi decent content. And it's just paid for by advertising. Or if you pay for like YouTube Premium, thank you so much. It does actually pay me more than if you're watching without YouTube Premium. And I'm like, this is so good. And it's like, I don't do Patreon, I don't do any of that. Shit. Because I'm like, why do I have to take, I don't have to take money off you. And if I do, it's like, buy something cool, buy some merch, whatever. Like, it's just such a, I love it. It's so great. Uh, what the f are they talking about? Although Friends Reunited finally ditched the paywall in 2008, most of the users had already migrated and this just led to the site evolving into a dizzying wall of intrusive pop-up ads. Even in the final dying days of Friends Reunited, the website looked as if it firmly belonged in the year 2000 with no mobile support, no notifications to entice you back to the platform, no global presence, and absolutely nothing to suggest that ITV once paid £120 million for this promising new student and then just left it to wither at the back of the class. Yes! Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey Circus. Does anybody still go to the circus? No. I went to the circus once when I was a kid. It was a bit sh**. The greatest show on earth may have officially come to an end in 2017 after almost 150 years of duty, but I was surprised in a way to discover that circuses are still even a thing. I always associate the big tents, the lion tamers, trapeze artists, and creepy clowns with an era before I was born. I can distinctly remember telling my mate at school he should have a serious rethink about pinning all of his future career hopes on becoming a human cannibal because it was so last century. <laughs> this is one of those stories where it's like, yeah, I bet Danny made it up, but also given Danny's like crazy ass stories and backgrounds and stuff, I'm like, this could be a legitimate thing that Danny's friend wanted to do. What a world we live in. But no, I was wrong. Maybe the circus just never dared to visit my town. Ah, yes, the town of Rotherham. The roots of this particular circus stretch back to 1871 with the snappily titled P.T. Barnum's Grand Traveling Museum, Menagerie, Caravan, and Hippodrome. My lord. And the titles hadn't got any snappier by 1919 when the outfit known as Barnum & Bailey Circus merged with another circus owned by the Ringling Brothers to form Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey Circus. Oh, guys, just call it The Circus. <laughs> or BBB Circus. Bros, Barnum & Bailey. For the rest of the century, The Greatest Show on Earth made the cumbersome trip via railroad across America. Although the operation was to witness many changes over the decades that passed, the traditional big top was ditched in 1956 in favor of sports stadiums and arenas, and the company was acquired by Feld Entertainment in 1967 during a period which saw a massive streamlining of the operations to make the railroad journeys less of a bumpy headache. Even as late as the 1990s, the circus was still pulling in big business. I feel like it only did this because people like the nostalgia. But I'm pretty sure the only reason I went to the circus once was because my parents had gone to the circus when they were kids and were like, yeah, let's go see what that's like. It's like, I remember, the oh, well, I know I was a kid when I went to Disney. But like, I'm sure the that I do now, or I did as a kid, that I will also expose my kids to, even though it's like, Dad, why would we care about the shit? We got Facebook. <laughs> why would we? No, the kids don't. They, they've, got, they've got whatever's, you know, hot. TikTok. They're on the IG. They're like, why would we be outside even? <laughs> you hell, Dad. You fucking boomer. Boomer! Daddy, chill. But over the next decade, attendance had swiftly dropped by 50% and the future of the company was looking bleak. I'd assume that this was entirely down to increased public concerns over the welfare of the animals, but that's only part of the story. I think people just got bored. It's like, look, we ain't gonna movies and see Tom Cruise going into space to do stunts. Or we could go to the circus and watch a guy on a big swing. Okay. <laughs> I know what I'd rather do. That's for goddamn sure. Tommy Boy in Space! Following a 14-year-long legal tussle with the Humane Society of the United States and other animal welfare groups, I was surprised to learn that Feld Entertainment actually walked away with a $16 million settlement in 2014. Ah! Your money or your life. 
You're smarter than you look. The groups had alleged the cruel treatment of Asian elephants in the circus violated the Endangered Species Act, but it was later revealed that one of the key witnesses, a former circus barn worker, had been paid $190,000 by the groups to give damning testimony against his former employees. Oh my god. No one's going to prison for that? That seems pretty f***ing illegal. That feels like more than like a civil offense. That feels like you're you're lying in court. Isn't that, that that's a crime, right? Isn't that what f Martha Stewart? Because she was like, it wasn't that she was inside of trading, it was that she lied about it, right? Because then it went from just like, well, inside of trading is also a crime, right? But she did some minor crime, and then she was like, no, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And then they were like, Martha, we could have just let you off, but you lied about not doing it. And then she went to prison. Allegedly, I'm not sure if that's what actually happened with Martha Stewart, which is so crazy. <laughs> like that Martha Stewart in prison. <laughs> Holy sh**. Uh, Feld may have come out smiling that day, but they didn't feel quite so vindicated during other visits to court. Some would claim that the circus employees treated the animals with more love and respect than the average pet shop owners put upon a pet dog or a cat. It would be nice to think that this was true, but videotaped footage showed in court suggests otherwise. Amongst other things, the footage filmed behind the scenes at Feld Circus reveals trainers repeat repeatedly striking elephants with bull hooks. What the f is a bull hook? I don't know, but it sounds scary. It sounds like a bullwhip with like a fishing hook on the end, which sounds like a f***ing nightmare. Beating tigers during dress rehearsals and forcing an elephant to perform despite the obvious signs that she was seriously ill and suffering with abdominal pains. Okay, so it sounds like they paid that guy to lie in court, but it was also paying him, what? Did, was he just like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm gonna have to be paid if you're gonna have to, t I'm gonna tell about all that animal abuse, right? Guys, the animal abuse? Yeah, I'll definitely be talking about that animal abuse that's definitely going on behind the circus. And the other guys are like, he must be being sarcastic with that tone of voice, right? And he's like, no, just, he wasn't. He's just not. And then he gets a huge paycheck and he just tells the truth. <laughs> I'm lost. This doesn't surprise me. <laughs> The company agreed to pay a fine of $270,000, but this seemed like money taken from the petty cash when you consider the size of their other big payday in court. Feld eventually agreed to remove elephants from the show in 2016. They took them out back and shot- You what? <laughs> no, they didn't. And it could be suggested that this directly led to the closure of the circus just a year later. But ticket sales were already in rapid decline long before Nelly packed her trunk and all bada bum bum and the high cost of the move of moving the show around the country was proving to be economically unfeasible. CEO Kenneth Fells claims that the real reason for the close for closing the book on this 146-year story is because the kids of today prefer playing on their consoles and they lack the attention pan span to sit still for a two-hour show. Yeah, also consoles are they're, they're just kind of better, aren't they? Mervins. It might be a little sad to see a company fall into decline after neglect, poor management, or failing to keep up with its competition, but it's a downright brute. But it's downright brutal to see a business getting murdered in a cold and calculated manner by its owners. And that's kind of what happens with Merv happened with Mervins, which was allegedly strangled to death by the people at the very top in charge of the first strings. I don't feel like this is super uncommon. Isn't this just the people like, oh, this is going shit. like the, all those shady business dealings that you hear about, where it's like. Yeah, well, he took all the pension money and he ran off on his, like, super yacht somewhere. Like, what's his name? That guy, the British guy. He, Danny's always ragging on and I'm always saying allegedly about. Like, it's always like, yeah, yeah, they're just taking loads of money out of the company because they're like, fuck you, everyone else. I'm getting rich and then it is hitting it a hard. But it's okay because I've got a massive boat. The mid-range department chain had humble beginnings in 1949 when Mervyn G. Morris opens the very first store in California, famous for selling clothing, furniture, bedding, electronics, housewares, and any old sh really. It sounds like Woolworths. The store was not also known for its heavily discounted range of factory seconds, which came with very minor flaws that would go largely unnoticed by the untrained eye. At its peak, Mervyn's had expanded into 266 stores across 14 states, but perhaps the writing was on the wall in 1978 when it was sold to a legacy department store, Dayton Hudson, for $300 million. Dayton Hudson seemed more interested in expanding their separate range of Target stores, and Mervyn's faced a gradual decline over the next couple of decades. It was suggested by many that the real estate uh, on the portfolio of Mervyn's was possibly more valuable than the business ventures which were operating inside them. By 2004, Dayton Hudson, who by now had remained, renamed themselves the Target Corporation in honor of their favorite brand, was ready to sell Mervyn's following, Mervyn's following store closures 
and a further decline in sales. They reckoned at the time that they would only consider selling to a buyer who'd keep the brand running and ensure the job security of 30,000 employees who still worked under a Mervyn store sign. I can predict what's going to happen. Someone's going to buy it and be like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're definitely going to keep Mervyn's running. We're definitely not going to shut it down, fire everybody, and squeeze every little bit of money out of it. And then, and then, well, it's okay because we've got massive boats. Stop fucking lying. Uh, but I feel like this isn't a unique story. Doesn't this happen very often? Mervyn's was sold off to three pro. Oh God, it's a private equity company. They are like the, when it's like companies, you know, I'm often saying like, don't expect companies to do good things because they're not people. They don't, they don't have a conscious. Like, for <laughs> sake, stop expecting companies to do good things. They either have to do good things because they've got fear of legislation or they have to be legislated against. You know, because generally, like, while I'm a capitalist, too many people are doing capitalism while being a piece of shit. And what was I talking about? Yeah, private equity firms seem to be, like, the generally, generally the epitome of uh, capitalism while being a dickhead, including Cerberus Capital Management. Cerberus in capital management. You really chose the most evil name you could possibly think of, didn't you? And Sun Capital Partners. And then you chose the most generic name, reportedly for over a billion dollars, which seems a tad pricey for a struggling department store. By 2008, nudged along by the Great Recession, Mervyn's had closed its doors for the last time after racking up $800 million worth of debt. But the three private equity companies didn't seem too distressed about this. Certainly not as distressed as Myers creditors, who smelled a rat. It was alleged that the private equity firms had separated Mervyn's into two distinct businesses, the retail stores and the real estate. Well, I mean, okay, so my example of like them being shitty, you know, where it's like, ah, oh, they close it down and they take all the money. This is doubly shitty, because you're really f***ing the people who lent you money. And it, is this a public company? Because then you're just f***ing people who are shareholders, which is even more dicky than just bank. Um, I don't like it either way, and it's extra shady, allegedly, you dickheads. They then transferred the real estate into entities which were beyond the reach of the creditors. That sounds like it shouldn't be f***ing legal. And, to start, and suddenly started char charging the retail arm an absolute fortune for rents on the properties that it had previously owned for decades. For an encore, they then allegedly took dividends from the real estate arm, which amounted to $400 million each, while, pur while purposefully, allegedly, driving the retail arm into the ground with those debts of $800 million. It sounds a bit like a lesson taken from the f Sir Philip... Ah, Sir Philip Green! from the Sir Philip Green School of Business, allegedly. After getting sued by the creditors for taking fraudulent profits, good, good, I'm glad this is a crime, the private equity firms are reported to have played, paid a $166 million settlement. Oh, it was a civil thing. Why couldn't it have been a cri- This sounds like they should be in, th there should be crimes here, like proper crimes. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Not civil crimes where it's like, oh yeah, we'll slice you a bit off the profits. So just to f off. This sounds like if Martha Stewart can go to prison for f it, what the f Come on! But there won't be too much consolation for the tens of thousands of employees who lost their jobs on mate. That was happening anyway, though. I mean, I feel bad and it sucks, but that was happening anyway. These f private equity companies, they, they pulled some shady shit. Still, at least they paid something back over here in the UK would probably have just knighted everybody at fault in the scandal and then treated them to a day out at the circus to enjoy the company of their fellow clowns. Ah yes, a callback to a previous video. And Sir, Sir Phil. Sir Phil, rise. How does he, he's still got his sir, huh? Allegedly. I mean, he does. Allegedly, maybe they, he shouldn't. Right. Anyway, this has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, purchase some merch. Yes, purchase the merch.co. Check out this free Danny. Yes, thank you for watching. See you next time. It came to me in a dream. 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 It came to me in a dream.